So a warm welcome to Optilon's Supply Chain Conference 2021 with a theme thriving in uncertainty and preparing for the future. Now, for the past 15 years, Optilon has hosted the Supply Chain Conference, and I've had the pleasure to host for the past four years. My name is Sabinia von Gafka. I'm an international communications catalyst, a moderator, and also a social entrepreneur. And it's truly exciting to welcome you all to a new format of the Supply Chain Conference, as we've transitioned from a very appreciated offline event to a really dynamic setting here in a live studio broadcast. Now, supply chains, as we know, are typically designed for efficiency, cost, and closeness to markets. However, not always necessarily for transparency and resilience. And this is something that are crucial factors today when supply chains operate in a world where disruption is a constant factor. Now, thriving in uncertainty and preparing for the future means building resilience and also transparency while minimizing exposures to shocks or force majeures and building the capacity to respond. So today we want to put the spotlight on you as an individual, but also as a company and really inspire you to make your business future proof. We have an interesting and really inspirational lineup of international speakers who will be joining me here in the studio, but also via link. And they're here to inspire you to become more resilient and really prepare your business for the future. I also want to encourage all of you, our viewers, to, to be interactive today. Um, as you see in your browser, there are different functions, and one of them, to your left-hand side, it says chat function. And in there, you can send in questions during um, today's agenda to the specific speakers that we have, and I'll try to raise as many as I can. You can also show appreciation and so forth with sending emojis um, just to sort of keep the flow of conversation. And we'll also be having polls. Polls are where I ask you questions, and there are different answer alternatives just to get your engagement in the conversation. Um, if you want to post anything on social media, please use the hashtag OptilonSCC. And um, before we kick off, let's try a poll just to see that you're on par with that. So the question should be coming up in your browser window now. And the poll is, what is the most typical disruption that you have experienced in your supply chain or career? And there are several different answers. So while you're thinking, I'll read them up. Price and currency fluctuations, trade conflicts, cyber attacks, natural disasters, people cause disruptions, regional instability, pandemic or other. So let's see what results we have 
with our first poll question. And as we can see, I would say I'm not surprised. Of course, we have the pandemic that, of course, has been, you know, a crucial impact on the whole world. And then on second place, price and currency fluctuation. So there is sort of a good divide um, along all of them. So maybe we can get some clarity um, in how to sort of really address these disruptions in the future. So now we're going to kick off today's supply chain conference. And there's no way better to do that than for me to introduce the CEO of Optilon, Rikard Parkeval. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Optilon Supply Chain Conference 2021. My name is Rikard Barkeval and I am the CEO of Optilon. And it's a big pleasure for me and for the whole Optilon team to welcome you to our yearly conference. For more than 15, 15 years, Optilon has hosted physical conferences. This year, we have changed to an online supply chain conference with a new uh, dynamic setting. And we welcome you to take part and enjoy speakers from around the world. Over the past years, speakers from Amazon, Carlsberg, Einride, Harley Davidson, IKEA, SKF, Tetra Pak, Tesla, Uber, and many more have been our guests. The theme this year is uh, thriving in uncertainty, preparing for the future. And it means building resiliency by improving the supply chain and transparency, minimizing exposure to shocks and building the capacity to respond. So our speakers want to put spotlight on what you as an individual and as a company can do to improve your response. And they will challenge your mindset by answering questions like, what kind of demand shifts can we see in the future? With all new technology, how will the future of work look like with the demise of the traditional job? And how will we move from big data to human data? It's an honor for me to present the speakers of the day. We start with Matt Britton, Thomas Björnsten and Jan Wikström. And after a short break, uh, we will listen to our panel discussing how we can realize the full potential of supply chain sustainability. And here we have Eva Grönberg, Carl Orling and Alice Hinrichen. And then we continue with uh, Manuel Mayhofer, Andreas Wieland and finally Andrew Spence. We give them all a warm welcome. When you leave the conference this afternoon around four o'clock, I hope you are inspired and ready to thrive in uncertainty. And I also hope you are prepared for the future. Once again, warm welcome. Now it's time for me to hand over to our favorite supply chain conference moderator, Sabine von Gafke. Yeah. Let's start and welcome Sabine. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you for a perfect introduction. Thank you. And like Richard say, we really do hope that this is going to be a source of inspiration and of course also knowledge and insights. Now Richard touched upon it. We're gonna start this first section with three speakers who'll be looking at three different themes. It's going to be around the conscious consumer, around human human data and also around the unredeemed potential of the supply chain. Now, starting off with the theme of the conscious consumer. I mean, we're living in an age of digitalization and information society. So the consumers are truly getting more and more conscious and also demanding. Now, a conscious consumer looks beyond the label and really evaluates a company's motive, purpose and authenticity before making their consumption choice. So understanding the conscious consumer has never been more relevant. And that is why we're really excited to have Matt Britton with us today as our keynote um, opening speaker, because Matt is a leading expert, one of America's leading experts on the new consumer, where he focuses on the generation Y and Z. And he's consulted for over half of the Fortune 500 companies over the past two decades. And he really has a unique ability to connect the dots between the new consumer culture of today 
and the business trends of tomorrow. His best-selling book is titled Youth Nation and has created what one could say a modern roadmap um, to approach a generation with power and influence. So with that, I want to say a warm welcome to Matt, who is joining us via link. So Matt, thank you for joining us and I hand over the word to you. Thanks so much for having me. I only wish that I could be there in person. Um, this has been a very, very interesting uh, couple years, I guess a year and a half for me as a speaker and a consultant, having to shift from the live world to one where we're virtual, but um, hopefully I can deliver just as much value for all of you today. Uh, my name is Matt Britton, and I've spent my entire career really trying to decode what it means to be a new consumer and how that impacts business, culture, and society. So we will uh, jump right in if we can get the slides up. Um, we will start going. So 2021, as we all know, has had the most stress reported in 15 years. Some would think that 2020 would create more stress for consumers, but the reality is that in 2020, it was almost a shock to the system of, of consumers, especially younger consumers around the world. They had never even know what a pandemic was, let alone experience it firsthand. But in 2020, 2021, we had this dichotomy that's really occurred uh, for so many consumers, which is, are we still in a state of pause or should we be pushing to return to normal? And it, no matter what market you are in around the world, there's kind of been this start, stop, start, stop mentality, which has really caused so much anxiety and stress for consumers and businesses alike. One in two people have said their emotional state has been impacted most recently by the Delta variant. Um, and I think I can understand personally because you're at a point, especially exiting the summer, where most people thought, okay, when we come back to the fall, we will have conferences like this one in person. We'll be able to see people, we'll be able to go into offices and schools. And in many markets around the world, that simply is not the case. So the mindset of the consumer heading into the fall, heading into the holiday season, is like one that we've never seen before in history. Um, Amazon, for example, just announced they're pushing their uh, you know, return to office back until January, until at least January, uh, and it's impacting the recovery of, of Seattle where Amazon is based. So we're seeing major cities being impacted by decisions of large tenants and large corporations who don't really know what the right uh, path forward is, and that obviously has a trickle-down impact to all the surrounding businesses that support Amazon's tens and hundreds of thousands of employees in their local markets where they have offices. So what I want to do today is look at the mind of the consumer, the, the current state of the consumer through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for those of you who know, uh, who don't know what Ma Maslow's hierarchy of needs are, it's essentially um, a, a pyramid that shows what the human being cares about most, starting with the need to feel safe, uh, to protect themselves and, and, and their loved ones. The second is love and belonging, the need to connect with others. The third is esteem, the, the ability to feel confident and moving about uh, your life in a way with purpose. Uh, the fourth is about aesthetics, how you look and present yourself to the world and society. And the last is self-actualization. How are you going to take your, your personal embodiment and your persona and impart it on the world to actually make an impact and actualize who you believe you are? And when you look at the current state of the consumer through the minds of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it really can, in my opinion, gives an interesting filter into how the consumer is thinking and feeling today. So we're going to dive right into it. First and foremost, we talk about safety needs, the security uh, of an individual, their, their employment, their resources, and their morality of family and of health. Um, one thing that we have seen all around the world is this notion that consumers were going to be exiting uh, you know, major cities. This exodus of major cities was really driven by the fact that more consumers needed more space, but a lot of it actually was indeed driven and is indeed driven by safety. Many consumers feel that the need to go on public transportation or be in highly dense urban areas actually really is a threat to their personal safety. So what we've seen in many markets is consumers move out of major cities and what it's really done is created a massive housing boom um this is in, in america but you look at the home prices and you know they are at levels that we haven't seen um in in well over a decade uh and and the, in many markets the the prices of homes continue to go up because consumers in their push for safety are now looking at their home as a core investment 
So while pre-pandemic, people were more prone to travel um, and maybe not spend as much time and money in the home, now the new conscious consumer is looking at the home as their new headquarters. In many instances, it's their office, it's their gym, um, and it's their kid's school. And because of that, we're seeing a massive reinvestment within the home. We're also seeing a surge in car prices as more and more consumers, again, are starting to dread public transportation and see public transportation itself as a threat to their personal safety. So what we're seeing as a byproduct of that is a huge demand on both new and used automobiles all around the world, uh, obviously causing major supply chain issues um, in the automotive industry where many consumers now are paying more for used cars than they would for a new car just because they can't get their hands on a new car. Um, so two thirds of people actually are actually also thinking about their personal safety. There's companies like Simply Safe, uh, which basically just had a hundred thirty million dollar investment. Simply Safe is a home security company. So not only are people worried about should I be in the city, should I not be in public transportation, but I'm going to actually invest in my home security. So again, that core, the need to feel safe and protect yourself and those around you, is having a big impact on business with the conscious consumer as we are here in fall of 2021. The second is the sense of friendship, intimacy, family, and sense of connection. Something many of us have felt quite a void of in this virtual world. I would love to be on stage right now looking at everyone's faces and getting that uh, kind of emotional reaction from everybody, but that's not something I get. I also don't get the um, kind of response and the relationships from my employees every day that work for me because I don't see them as much. So we all have this sort of void um, of kind of community and connection and consumers are seeking out a variety of different ways to fill that void. Um, a company called Bumble, which is a, a dating app that just went public, um, is going strong and stronger than ever as more and more single consumers uh, go to dating apps and, and other platforms to connect with people because they don't have the ability to go to bars and, and nightclubs and restaurants any, uh, anymore as much to connect with people. So we're seeing a huge rise in online dating apps and community-driven um, activities. Weddings are back. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the, the divorce uh, phenomenon during the pandemic where people who didn't really maybe feel like the love towards each other during the pandemic, it kind of got exposed because they can go anywhere. They know distractions. But the flip side of that is we're actually seeing around the world a massive rise in weddings as this has kind of reframed consumers' mindset about how important it is to actually have those close personal connections when something like a pandemic happens. So that actually created a massive boom in weddings um, around the world. The third is esteem, the feeling of respect, self-esteem, status, recognition, and freedom. It's really the ability for you to feel like that you are a person that is recognized in the world for who you are. Um, right now, consumers are feeling good about the economy in many areas of the world. In the US, consumer confidence unexpectedly uh, rose for the sixth month in July and continues to rise. We obviously know that the impact of stimulus around the world may be short-lived, and we don't know how long the strong consumer confidence is lasting. But from an economic standpoint, many consumers, ironically, um, are feeling pretty good because there's record high savings right now. Many consumers didn't spend on luxury goods during the pandemic, and because of that, they're feeling well, good about themselves as it relates um, to their financial status. Uh, we've seen this also play out, obviously, in the e-commerce world. This is a stat and a graph that's been shared around widely by Bank of America that shows there is more growth in e-commerce sales on an eight-week period from March to April of 2020, going from 16% of overall penetration of retail sales to 27% than there was in the 10 years prior. So you're seeing massive acceleration as a result of consumers feeling good about their financial status, their esteem, and they're putting that to work through their spending, uh, through their wallets and, and, and their dollar share. And that creates obviously big opportunities, especially those that actually could take advantage of this new e-commerce driven world. Some companies like Nike are leaning into the fact that they know that they're building up consumers' esteem through association with their brands, so much so that they were confident enough to pull their brands off of Amazon and actually sell directly to consumers so they can maintain that lifestyle-driven brand that they've been so successful in building uh, around the world. And this e-commerce phenomenon is causing CPG companies like PepsiCo, who in the past didn't really have to worry about e-commerce because they were selling their products in big box retailers and grocery stores, but now understanding that more consumers are buying food and snacks online, so even they have to shift to an e-commerce driven world. 
Um, the, the investment community uh, with platforms like Robinhood have exploded in recent months. More money is poured into the stock market in the past five months than in the last 12 years as consumers, again, feel financially secure enough to actually start investing at very early ages. So it's really impacting the markets on a macro basis um, as well. Part four is about the pursuit of beauty and creativity, the, the notion of aesthetics and actually the way that you present yourself uh, to the world. The pandemic drastically impacted how people feel about themselves. Over 40% of women say uh, that COVID negatively impacted how attractive they feel, but only 26% of men, uh, which is an interesting fact in terms of how this might have impacted the beauty industry and the makeup industry. But overall, aesthetics now are, is taking a renewed level of importance as some consumers want to get out in the world again. Platforms like Peloton, which allowed consumers to stay fit and healthy during the pandemic, have had a great run um, as consumers have had more time and in many instances focus on their bodies, focus on their personal appearance. And Peloton's a perfect example of a company that has taken advantage of this. We're also seeing a rise talking about sustainability in plant-based foods, healthy alternatives, consumers trying out new food types, cooking more at home. And we're seeing the plant-based food industry explode as of late, as more and more consumers veer to more healthy eating habits um, in the plant-based sector. And though even now the luxury sector, one that really struggled early on in 2020, is coming roaring back as consumers again have this renewed focus on aesthetics. Companies like Armani bounced back um, and had a 34% rise in the first half of sales as, as luxury now is back um, in the crosshairs of consumers where in many instances, again, there's record high savings and a renewed focus on consumer aesthetics. And then finally, self-actualization, desire to be the most you can be, reaching your full potential, the very top of Maslow's hierarchy. Well, many consumers really um, associate their ability to have self-actualization with travel and adventure and experiences. And in that regard, global platforms like Airbnb have and will continue to see demand as more and more consumers want to escape the home that in many instances they've been trapped in for so long and actually get on the road and travel, but do so in a way that protects their own safety and security, meaning they may not want to go to hotels and lobbies where they're around other people and risking getting sick. So Airbnb is obviously seeing a, a massive boom. And more and more consumers in their quest for self-actualization are also focused on remote learning and e-learning, online tools, not just for kids, but for adults who actually want to broaden their horizons and learn more and expand with platforms like Skillshare. The e-learning market is expected to now reach over $172 billion by 2028. So a massive opportunity for businesses to educate. And no matter what company you are, there's a big opportunity for you to educate your customers. People are spending more time than ever before in social media platforms, consuming online content. And if you're a brand, the best way for you to connect with consumers is really to educate them through content because there's obviously limitless demand in that area right now. Another area in self-actualization we're seeing really take off is the DIY market around the world. Consumers left to their own devices have figured out how to fix things around the house and create crafts and do things that they never thought they'd have the time to do before because they're not spending as much time commuting. So the sense of consumers feeling empowered as a part of self-actualization to do things on their own is a huge trend that we continue to see. And then lastly, we are seeing consumers more than ever before stand up for the causes that they believe in because they have more time to research and think about what's important to them. One huge cause is obviously global warming which and overall sustainability for companies. Um, it's a huge push that we're seeing, especially with the Gen Y, Gen Z consumers, and one that they're trying to impart on the brands that they patronize each and every day. So that is how the consumer is thinking right now through the filter of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I know I talk really fast. I know it's super uh, early, at least it is for me here in New York. It's uh, just past 7 a.m., but I really appreciate the Optalon team for having me today. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to take some questions. Otherwise, you can feel free to reach out to me directly at the contact information you see. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt. A truly relevant and interesting and, and, I mean, a fast track of what is happening around the world. And also such an interesting perspective to use Maslow's hierarchy um, needs because it truly shows that, you know, we, we're going from the top always is about starting from the bottom again. So truly, yes. truly interesting to sure. see that. Now, a variety of, of questions um, I've asked our 
let me just see what we have questions here. I have a few coming up in my mind, but I wanted to also have the, uh, the viewers. So f one question is, what would be your best advice to business leaders in terms of understanding the future generations? I mean, of course, you addressed a lot of it in the presentation, but maybe just sure. like the top three. Yeah, one thing I do is I try to aggregate on Twitter a list of influential people that both analyze the new consumer and also are new consumers themselves and really spend a lot of time reading um, what they're feeling and thinking and the stories that they're sharing, trying to get into the minds of the consumer. Um, if you're in business, you always want to be conducting research and, and talking to consumers and bouncing feedback off them. Right now, there is a wealth of online tools that allow you to gauge consumer feedback. And that's something you should certainly be doing. And then lastly, just looking at the world around you and examining trends and, and, and seeing why they're aligned outside that store and what does it mean. For example, I was in the Soho area of New York City and I saw a line around the corner at, at, at a luxury clothing store. And it made me think, why is this happening right now? And, and it got obviously made it into my presentation. So the things that you see around the world, if you look at it through a different lens, obviously can illuminate you to what's going on with the consumer as well. Mm. And also, I mean, with your expertise, looking at consumerism and looking at sort of the generation Y, Z and, and, and baby boomers and so forth, what do you foresee if we look sort of in the five years to come? I mean, it's yeah. as though we've had, you know, pressed a restart button where consumerism, that the society is going back to certain normalcy, but also this disruption of trust. I mean, how do you see yes. them sort of fusing maybe going forward? So, I mean, I think you're 100% right. I think brands really have a trust gap right now. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I think they can close that gap is by changing the way that they communicate with consumers. And I mm -hmm. think what that means is they need to shift from an advertising based mentality saying, buy my product 30% more absorbent, 50% more horsepower, right? Your unique selling propositions to a content based mentality, which is mm -hmm. what do you care about when you wake up in the morning? What are your unmet needs and how can we fit in and actually add value to your lives? Mm -hmm. So I think having a content framework, always trying to think about how you can add value over time is going to be how brands build trust and really break through in this new world. Mm. And it really showcases, you know, purpose, something that we've been talking about for so many years yes. has surfaced as never before and really come to have some kind of real value to it. So Matt, Absolutely. thank you so much for all of your knowledge and for all the great work that you're doing. Really appreciated that you could uh, be with us today. And yeah, stay hope safe. to be there in person in the future. Yeah. Take stay care. safe thank and healthy. You. Thank you. Thank you. So Talking about transparency, one way of working with resilience and transparency is to work with end-to-end -end transparency and demand shifts. So today, in general, we talk a lot about big data, big data being the new gold, but add to this human data, which is about looking at the human factor in a data-driven business and creating a sort of a balanced balance between data technology and humans is now on top of the agenda for many companies and organizations around the world. And our next speaker, Thomas Bjornstein, works in the indisciplinary field between data, human sense-making, and marketing communication. And he is in charge of Innovation Lab's human data department and assistant professor at Aarhus in Denmark. And he specializes in the industry 5.0 and the human data perspective. So with that, I say a warm welcome to Thomas Bjornstein, who is joining us via link and Thomas I hand over the word to you thank you very much and thank you for this uh, this warm presentation uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't join you physically but I'll, I'll do my best to keep you focused uh, through, through my virtual presence here from from Aarhus uh, as it was just mentioned I work within the field of uh, human data at innovation lab um, I come from a background in research and projects with institutions such as MIT and Georgia Tech and during the past several years, I've also worked with the industry and businesses. And I am very intrigued by the main theme of this conference. And so that theme is also my uh, point of departure. Um, I'll just see if my clicker works here. Yes, so there we go. We know there are many ways of defining uncertainty. And, uh, and here's one. Namely that uncertainty can be thought of as the state of an organism that lacks information about whether, where, when, how, or why an event has occurred or will occur. Uh, this definition is a very rough summary of some of the main points uh, made by the famous economist Frank Knight 
in a book that was published in 1921. So that's exactly 100 years ago. And so the question of what defines uncertainty has been connected with theories and models for market and business optimization for ages. And uh, the, the efforts for calculating and predicting risk and unexpected occurrences in supply, demand, and distribution have an equally long history. But what is striking uh, already when economists such as Frank Knight thought about this in the beginning of the past century, what is striking is that uh, besides the financial and statistical modeling of risk and uncertainty, they also address how uncertainty is a feeling. So if we say that uncertainty on the organizational and strategic level is about a lack of information, uncertainty on the human level in an organization is about having a feeling of not knowing. And this is what I'm going to talk about, emotions and feelings as a human factor that matters for our decision making, and which also matters for technological innovation in a market and at, at workplaces that are increasingly uh, driven by AI and, uh, and data analysis of customer demands. And so I see this within the broader scope of discussing if AI can make us more certain about the future um, and if we will trust AI to do this and what role emotions can play. What I find to be one of the most interesting domains within data-driven business innovation is emotion computing and emotion AI. This is basically a field of technologies that make use of automated detection of human emotions and feelings. And it's uh, done through techniques such as uh, facial recognition, speech and text analysis, biosensing, uh, motion capture, etc. And among other things, uh, it applies for areas such as marketing and uh, market research to analyze consumers' emotional reactions to campaigns and to products, services, uh, and more. So for some time now, we've been able to detect if customers are angry, upset, or happy based on such analysis. And the future perspective is very much about becoming better at uh, predicting those reactions. So emotion computing is basically the combination of advanced machine learning with the field of human psychology. And almost every big tech company during the past few years uh, has been investing in it. That's also why we see stories like this. Uh, this is particularly related to so-called emotion AI. And the AI perspective here is about uh, technology that automatically understands human behavior and emotions and can learn to react more human-like and emotional. And this statement uh, by Gartner, which was widely circulated a few years back, claimed that by 2022, your personal device will know more about your emotional state than your own family. So mind you, this is already next year, so you better prepare for this. Um, if we take a brief look at how the market for emotion detection and recognition has developed, these are the types of numbers that we see for uh, current projections. And I've been looking into several reports, and we are at an expected value in a few years well beyond $35 billion and at a significant growth rate. So this is a really interesting market to follow in itself. But emotion computing is also part of a uh, general scrutiny that sweeps over many AI initiatives at the moment. This is reflected here in an article from last week that reports how Google, Microsoft, and IBM have all canceled projects that make use of emotion recognition technologies. So this is a challenging field of both data opportunity and regulation that emotion computing is navigating right now. And here we also can't ignore the EU charters and projects within AI, within AI research. Um, because what we see now is a very strong focus on the human centric. So from an EU perspective, the aim is to provide a framework for building trustworthy and ethical AI and build those systems based on human values. This is also prominent in a, a recent report on the expected move from industry 4.0 to 5.0, which emphasizes uh, sustainability, human centrism and resilience as guiding principles for AI. Uh, these political demands, uh, we can also uh, see tie in closely with the current business codes of ethics and procedures that have uh, things like explainability and transparency on, on top of the AI agenda. So in short, it's about having a, this is about having a set of methods that allow human users to comprehend and trust the results and output created by algorithms. Um, and just to finish off this, this broader outlook, uh, this is something we observe globally now. 
we observe this for what defines future AI research and development. This is also the case with uh, Myla in Montreal, as an example. This is a leading research and technology advisory institute that has over 500 researchers specializing in the field of machine and deep learning. And their core mission is explicitly to be a global pole for innovation in the development of AI for the benefit of all. So the human aspect of AI is no longer just uh, like a funny idea or something we may dream of, it is now guiding the development. But going back to current business, as we know, a main reason for investing in AI and data-driven solutions is that it should enable an organization uh, and its employees, of course, to make better decisions. And these quotes here from two different reports on cognitive supply chain innovation point to that. So on the one hand, the IBM report says that uh, we'll have supply chain capabilities that can feel and perceive, react and learn. So that is a system which is very human-like. And on the other hand, the KPMG report points out how humans are often too slow to process information. And one of the reasons for this uh, last challenge that, that we lack as humans is exactly that we are emotional beings. We know among the many biases that are always present in human decision making that emotions and moral motivations play a, a very significant role. And we know that these biases or that's errors that we systematically make, they can take us down some risky and very unprofitable paths. Um, this brings me back to emotion computing and how emotions matter in future AI and data-driven business development. In short, it's not about separating data from emotions, it's about bringing them together so that the systems we build will also include the value of emotion analysis, but without replicating the human biases. And we can see at least two overall application perspectives for this at the moment. One is the analysis and computing of emotions external to the organization. That could be emotion analysis for enhancing something like customer and consumer insights, for instance. And the other is what we may call the internal emotion analysis methods that have a focus on the organization itself and its individual employees. So for the external perspective, it's already been part of your uh, corporate communications playbook for a while to deploy methods of social listening, which is uh, all about collecting data from what's being said about your company, your industry, or your brand on social media, which is a place where people willingly leave their opinions and also very emotional opinions. And at the core of this method is the analysis of positive and negative emotional reactions. And now with AI optimization, we'll very likely be able to generate much more detailed insights according to the actual emotional baselines of customers. And then use that for faster automated service replies, for instance, integrated with the use of emotion AI driven chatbots. Another important development within automated analysis of um, what we could broadly call online communication is trend estimation. This slide refers to a research project that predicts trends. So very briefly, the model can estimate future trends by analyzing social media content from a novelty perspective. So looking at the difference between new and old. And then if that novelty sticks within an online community, then we get an indication of what will soon be trending on a, uh, on a broader scale, you could say. And the scope for this is quite wide especially when uh, such models are combined with emotion analysis, then we may end up with some very interesting predictors for future main trends before they become obvious and widespread, and also without doing uh, traditional customer, and, server, uh, customer and, and user service. So this is a particular example of how AI and emotion research and analysis could actually make us more certain about the future. Moving from the external to the internal emotion computing perspective, um, then again, this has to do with the individual and very human feeling of, for instance, uncertainty that most of us experience uh, several times a day. Leading researchers now agree that emotions are not just something we have. Most of the time, we actually construct them from context and situations and specific events. Lisa Feldman Barrett has written an amazing book on this subject. And the point is that, when we acknowledge that emotions are also constructed, then we can be much more agile in terms of managing and using those emotions productively, also as part of, uh, of our working lives. 
Susan David has developed a thorough concept around this type of emotional agility, which can make us uh, better understand and recognize what it is that we are feeling and why we are feeling it. Now, if you remember this slide that talked about in 2022, how your personal device would know more about your feelings than your own family, this connects with the question of if we can use emotion data for this, why don't we? Well, this uh, future that is projected is basically already here. So last year, Amazon released their Halo device. And essentially, Halo is uh, an advanced fitness tracking uh, device. Uh, but besides tracking your pulse and heart rate and, and sleep patterns, etc., you can also have it monitor your emotional state over the course of a whole day. And the trick is that the built-in software measures the energy and positivity in your voice so you can better understand how you sound to others, how you're coming through. And often it can be really hard to assess your own emotional state and, and your tone of voice, but it seems that Amazon has actually done a really decent job developing a tool to assist us doing this. So um, ideally with this type of information, you could improve your communication with others in different situations, but there's also a deeper and even more interesting perspective, namely that we are now potentially able to track much more accurately in which context and situations our positive or negative negative emotional reactions occur. Uh, for instance, we'd be able to identify which emotions are connected with a feeling of uncertainty in specific conversations with others or in a specific context of decision making. And even though uh, this technology is not totally there yet, this points to a new generation of assistive technologies that might actually help us navigate some of these biases that often make us very uncertain and make us uh, take slower decisions. Um, today, we know for a fact, and this goes back to, uh, uh, to the slide with the, the many biases uh, that we know of. <clears throat> we know for a fact from research that when people understand and are able to regulate their emotions, they simply make less biased decisions. Again, if emotion computing can help us do this, why don't we use it more? Partly because of this. <clears throat> um, in his latest co-authored book, uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics and psychologist Daniel Kahneman points out how we know very well that algorithms can actually help us to reduce, uh, to cut through the noise of uncertainty and unregulated emotions. <clears throat> but we have big troubles trusting them, uh, the algorithms that is. So while we know and accept that humans can make mistakes, we generally expect machines to be perfect. And this is actually another bias. And it's a kind of intuitive habit that we need to rework to become better at using these assistive technologies. Fortunately, now we see some important steps uh, being taken towards adaption. Like I mentioned earlier, this concerns, for instance, the awareness of explainability and transparency, which is now emphasized by governments and businesses alike. And it concerns that we have to develop technologies that comply with human values. And those were my final words. And these are three takeaways that, takeaways that I the hope can inspire you to at least uh, reflect a bit on how we can move further. If you consider that your organization, for one thing, is an organism that processes both information and emotions, that to build trust in technology, we must accept that it makes mistakes along the way, as we would with human workers, and also that human-centric is now guiding development and future application in all AI areas. Thank you for listening. Thomas, thank you so much for a truly relevant and interesting presentation and really also seeing how the human component and especially what makes us most human, our emotions are now really, you know, intertwined in the whole sort of business and societal structures. So really, thank you for that. I wanted to just raise a few questions from our viewers. Um, and this one is more sort of bringing human data towards the supply chain. And will human data benefit the resilient supply chain? And if so, in what ways, if that's something in your line of expertise? Again, I would say, um, as I mentioned, for instance, with the very specific uh, device, the Halo device and, and the applications built into that, uh, if we see towards the, the individual uh, employee level, the technology is not perfect. Mm -hmm. But we see a very strong interest in integrating in all the other types of data that uh, that we gather and, and process for, for arriving at, at better insights, that the emotion and sentiment aspect is is now becoming part of that. Um, as I also hinted at, uh, 
through one of the slides, I mentioned that there's a, there's a very sort of critical scrutinizing view on some of these emotion data and emotion computing technologies. It is a controversial field. This is also the reason that, that many are sort of holding back for now. Uh, but again, if we look at the numbers and we look at the investments also uh, from the Asian market, this is a development that has exploded within the past few years. This, therefore, it's not something we can ignore. And I believe uh, really deeply that this will also become an integrated part of uh, supply chain and cognitive supply chain mm. development in, the very, uh, in, in a very short while. Mm. And I'm also sort of thinking about leadership, because leadership is also something that is in such transition, looking at sort of where the world is, is heading now, where purpose and mental well-being and all of these other aspects really come to the surface. How do you, what would be sort of your pieces of advice to leaders out there, how they really can learn to really integrate this human aspect um, while also, you know, maintaining their business? Because sometimes there's a sense of not collision, but a sense of not really knowing how to. Definitely. Again, I think it's important that we think of, of these technologies and some of the, the, the specific projects and applications that I mentioned here, that these are assistive technologies. Mm -hmm. They're not meant to take over your jobs or to take over leadership in any way. It, it can provide us with some further insights that we can use to sort of manage or be better at managing exactly those types of emotional situations that can be hard to assess. Mm -hmm. It's also important for me to, to, to underline that Having uh, positivity, like emotional positivity, as as your uh, primary baseline, it must is not necessarily a good and productive things, a, pr a productive thing. We need to have a a diversity and an acceptance uh, of a, the whole emotional range as something that defines the way we work. So in decision making, we often feel insecure, and that sort of uh, uh, results in a what we would immediately measure as negative emotions, but that's actually a very human aspect of us concentrating on things. Mm -hmm. So it's it's super important from a leadership perspective that that we do not just accept the most obvious selling points from these technologies, but make sure that we integrate them in the culture that is already there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And it sort of also points out this dynamic of inwards out of the personal development that is now sort of essential on, on all levels. Thomas, thank you so much for giving so much insight to this important topic. And, and thank you for taking the time to be with us and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. So Optilon has compiled a report with the name The Unnecessary Report that has analyzed 400 of the largest companies in the Nordics um, within supply chain and looked at the potential for the Nordic supply chain companies to really redeem a significant potential when it comes to unnecessary inventory, tied up working capital and unnecessary square meters used for storage and distribution. So we're now going to hear more about this and to talk us through the results of the report I say a warm welcome to Jon Wikström, who is Marketing Associate at Optilon. Thank you, Sabinia, for that introduction. And I want to start by saying that it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, it's super exciting, uh, not just because uh, we're organizing the conference again, but also because I'm among such great speakers. Um, so it, it's super thrilling for me. Now, um, we are going to go uh, into the topic more in depth a bit later, but I would like to start by actually giving praise to everyone that are working currently with or within supply chain. Because supply chain, it's something that exists everywhere. Uh, it's everywhere where the light touches. And without uh, the people working with supply chains, making sure that they function in the right way, uh, we wouldn't be able to get our daily necessities like food on the table, uh, we wouldn't be able to have a uh, running uh, healthcare system, and uh, the society would collapse. So I want you all that are working with supply chain to feel proud and know that you work with a very, very purposeful and important task. Now, speaking of purpose and uh, importance, I would like to give you a take on uh, what we at Optilon feel as uh, a very uh, sort of important uh, and purposeful task, because we have a very clear vision in our everyday operations. And that vision 
oops, is to make Nordic companies the most competitive in the world, because we truly believe that uh, that is po uh, possible. We also see that there are some challenges, such as that uh, the Nordic companies, they form a high cost environment. It's for instance, quite expensive to hire someone new. Uh, and we also have a geographically challenging location because we are high up on the globe, making the distances to import and export goods quite long. And with these two challenges, we have a very clear conclusion also in that Nordic companies need to be very careful about how they are utilizing their resources. They need to do that in a smart and optimized way. And we believe that in order to do that, you need to have the right supply chain planning, management and optimization. Now, today we are going to dive into one area of uh, supply chain management and optimization, namely efficient inventory optimization uh, and uh, management. Now, what do we mean with um, efficient inventory management and optimization? Well, uh, it's about balancing uh, the or to optimizing the flow of goods through the entire chain, every single node in the supply chain and answering to questions such as what kind of goods should I have in my assortment? How much of each good should I have in my assortment? Where should, should I al allocate it? In what quantities and at what time? Uh, so it's all about assuring the availability of the products that are actually demanded by the customer, while at the same time making sure that we are not keeping too much stock because then we would be tying a lot of money there. And we will get more into detail on what uh, efficient inventory management and optimization is later today when uh, we have uh, the great speaker from SKF uh, on stage. Um, but we would we then look into typical results that we can uh, uh, make, do po make possible through inventory management and optimization it could be summarized in these three categories. First of all, we have uh, the revenue increase. When you make sure that you always have uh, the right product at the right place at the right time, you will not be missing any sales. That will lead to an increased revenue. Secondly, we have the cost decrease. Uh, when we have the right mix of products, and we're not keeping any unnecessary products in the stock, we can reduce uh, distribution, we can reduce administration cost, we can reduce obsolescence, obsolescence uh, stock, and we can also free up inventory area. And all these are contributing to costs that we can decrease. And then the third part in, uh, in this uh, entirety is the working capital, which can be freed up. So by optimizing the safety stock levels uh, while still not compromising on the availability, we are able to free up working capital. And all of these three components will uh, lead to a total economic effect uh, that I will look more deeply into next. Now, as I mentioned, at Optilon, we are very driven uh, about uh, making the Nordic countries and the Nordic companies the most competitive in the world. So we are always very interested in what kind of potential do we have here uh, and what kind of things can we make possible through uh, inventory management and optimization. So we decided to do a study or an analysis where we included 100, the 100 largest companies of uh, four countries in the Nordics, uh, making a tol total of 400 companies from uh, Finland, Sweden, Denmark and Norway. We looked into their financial reports. We combined it with uh, the extensive experience and the results that we've gained uh, from our reference uh, customers, did some uh, strict and conservative assumptions and we came up 
with the number of a total potential of the total economic effect for only these 400 largest companies in the Nordics. And the total economic effect for these is 19 billion euros. Now, the number itself sounds uh, quite large, but to put it in a context for you, 19 billion euros, it's an equivalent of, for instance, 320,000 new job opportunities. It is also an equivalent of building the Tele2 arena, building the blocks building uh, in Copenhagen, building the Opera House in Oslo, and building the Audi library in Helsinki, times 56. So you can see that we are talking about quite a substantial amount of potential. We also looked into the inventory area that could be freed up if we would get rid of the unnecessary inventory. That number is 6,900,000 square meters for just these 400 largest companies in the Nordics. Uh, and this is an equivalent of 34,400 paddle courts, uh, which is actually almost as many paddle courts as we have worldwide. Uh, so we're talking about uh, quite a lot of space here. <coughs> now, when we did the analysis, uh, we didn't just focus on, on the entirety of these 400 companies. We also wanted to break it down to uh, country level and on sector level. So we focused on five different sectors, consumer goods, uh, retail, uh, industrial and uh, natural resources, uh, tech and life sciences, and wholesale and professional services. And uh, this enabled us to do a comparison between country and sector and all of our results in this analysis are documented and compiled in a report that we call the Unnecessary Report. The Unnecessary Report is a report that Optilon uh, aims to release once every year, where we do our take on different unnecessaries that could be avoided by applying better supply chain management, planning and optimization. And this report was actually released yesterday. So now it's available for grabs. If you would like to get more into detail on the methods we used in our analysis uh, and get your hands on even more results. But when you think of it, it's not just about um, understanding what the potential here is. Additionally, it's also about realizing that there is a great potential for everyone, regardless of your geographical location, regardless of your sector that you are acting within, and regardless of the size of your firm. So what I'm saying here is that supply chain planning, management and optimization shouldn't be um, deprioritized, it's a topic and area that can make great value for all companies that has a supply chain. And looking beyond the uh, results that we gained, it's of course about uh, getting, um, freeing up more money that you can use for further investment or hiring new people. But we have to remember that by doing these investments and by hiring the people, we can add even more, create even more subsequent value for our companies. Uh, and that's why I like to think about it as a ripple effect. So um, at this point, I would like to summarize and say that 
we urge all of you out there to join the journey to make Nordic companies the most competitive in the world by always remembering that through supply chain, planning, management and optimization, you can do a big difference. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And really important to sort of validate how much change can be made and sort of the steps um, to make this. And the unnecessary report, I got a question from um, the audience. Where can they download for more information about it? Where can they go on the, on the internet and download? Of course, it? that's a very relevant question. So um, right now it's available on the Optilon website. Mm -hmm. You can reach it by going into www.optilon.com. Mm -hmm. We have it under our resources. Um, it should be quite easy to find. Mm. Uh, if you have any troubles finding it, make sure to reach out to us and we will help you find it. But it's, uh, it's up for grabs um, and we would be happy to, to aid you in finding it. And, and another question, which I presume is also based on, sort of we've talked a lot about resilience and the importance of sort of building up resilience. Mm. So there's one question here. What is the link to building a resilient supply chain sort of with the um, facts and figures that you got from the report that you presented? That's a very good question. So, first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, the prerequisites uh, to have efficient inventory management and optimization is to have a digital solution mm. backing up your planning processes. Uh, and by having that in place, you really have the ability to react quickly when the disruptions occur. Mm. Additionally, I'd like to say that by freeing up unnecessary capital that you keep uh, in stock, you will have even more resources to use when the catastrophe mm. uh, happens. So um, that's for me sort of the uh, high fly reflections on that one. Great high fly reflections and also great insights with the report. So Jon, thank you very much for presenting that. And with that, we're now going to take a break just to give you a leg stretcher, but just to summarize sort of the first portion of, of this part of the conference. So we looked at the conscious consumer and to see sort of the trends around that and what is important for companies to think about. We then talked about human data and how much emotions are sort of part of both leading companies and also the, the leverage of our companies, but also how it's emerged in technology and how we can use human data to optimize our companies. And then we talked, like John talked about, the results from how you can optimize the supply chain channel. Now, before we go on a break, um, because after the break, we're going to have a really interesting panel where we're going to transition and talk about sustainability, which is the core of really um, building a resilient supply chain. I wanted to leave you with a poll so you have something to do in these few minutes of a break. And the poll, which should be up in your browser now, is which initiative do you find most important in order to increase your supply chain resiliency? And there are several different options there. So you think about that during the break, and then we'll look at the answers when we come back. So we'll be doing the live broadcast again at quarter past two, so make sure you're here on time. And thank you for watching in the meantime.
Tick-tock, 